Bonjour and welcome back to the World History Course. This is your professor, Philippe Girard. The last time I did a recording session, I told you that life in Louisiana was finally getting back to normal after Hurricane Laura. I may have spoken too soon. There is now yet another hurricane on the way. Again. As a historian, I know I'm supposed to give you an impartial view of the past, not a partisan take on the future, but at some point, enough is enough. Uh, we really need to do something about global warming. That cannot become the new normal. And I know that a lot of my local students work in the oil and gas industry, but please, uh, believe your favorite liberal history professor with his Japanese hybrid, we need to stop wrecking our planet. So if you hear the pitter-patter of raindrops in the background, that's just the outer bands of Hurricane Delta. And I'm just trying to get three quick lectures in the can before the you-know-what hits the fan. So here goes. Today we're starting section four of the course, which will focus on East Asia from roughly 1200 to 1500 AD. We'll spend not one, not two, but three lectures dealing with Mongol-related topics, what I like to call Mongol Week, Professor Gerard's answer to Shock Week. And then we'll study one country that managed to ward off Mongol invasions, and that would be a feudal Japan, before studying the dynasty that ruled China after the Mongols, and that would be the Ming dynasty. But let's start with the star of the show, the Mongols. They tend to have a bad reputation history. Their leader, Genghis Khan, is known as the Scourge of God. That says a lot. Uh, the Mongols are mostly known for killing millions of civilians and spreading the Black Death, which killed even more people, and for being the inspiration for the Dothraki and the Game of Thrones, who are also bloodthirsty ruffians on horseback. The Mongols remind me of the Vikings, who also have a bad rep. Uh, just like them, even though there is some truth to their terrible popular image, there was more to them than just bloodlust. Uh, the Mongols also fostered commerce, diplomacy, and long-distance cultural exchanges, which will be the topic of the next lecture. But first today, let's cover the military conquests. The Mongols came from, well, the, what is today Mongolia, i.e. the vast steppes of Eastern Asia, north of China. As a general rule, a region's climate is temperate if it's close to the ocean, and more extreme if it's far inland. A place like Great Britain, surrounded by the Atlantic, would be cool and humid year-round, uh, which you could see at a glance by looking at this uh, graph, which tracks temperatures and rainfall months by months. Notice how the temperature graph is pretty flat. It rarely gets hot in the summer, but it rarely freezes in the winter too, in England. But the Mongol hotland, located deep inside Eurasia, has a very continental climate. It gets extremely hot in the summer, 35 degrees Celsius and above, uh, whereas temperatures can dip to minus 40 Celsius in the winter. Notice how the temperature line goes very high and very low compared to Great Britain's. It also rains far less. Some historians have used the unforgiving climate of Central Asia as an explanation for the Mongols' fierceness and endurance. Uh, the harsh terrain supposedly bred a sturdy people who had to be tough and survive in that kind of environment. Again, kind of like the Vikings of Scandinavia. Uh, this is called geographic determinism, where a people's history is explained through its landscape. It has fallen out of favor with historians nowadays because it is deterministic. It doesn't allow for human agency. Uh, just look at the temperature graph and you can say these people will be world conquerors. Uh, it's out of favor, but I must say that the baby who's born in a yacht in the middle of a Mongolian winter, if he or she survives, that baby will be pretty much indestructible when he or she grows up. So I'm not ready to discount the geographic hypothesis altogether. Uh, we can discuss that in class in person. Well, the climate of Central Asia is also fairly dry, and for that, just look at the rainfall line of the graph, and so trees are few. Uh, so instead, think of vast rolling plains like the U.S. Great Plains, hemmed in by high mountain ranges and deserts like the Gobi Desert. The harsh temperatures and the lack of water made agriculture difficult for the Mongols. Uh, so instead, the Mongols, back then, just as now, uh, would live as cattle herders, raising cows, sheep, camels, and especially horses. Uh, the horse was really central to Mongol life. Uh, some Mongols even learned how to ride before they learned how to walk. 
and they use horses for everything, uh, for transportation, obviously, uh, but also for war, since the typical Mongol warrior was a mounted archer. We'll talk about that in a sec. And also for sustenance. Uh, the Mongols, they ate horse meat, they drank mare milk, and they also drank kumis, a fermented milk product that's the ancestor of yogurt today. Also part of their diet, a wine fermented from wheat and rice. And drunkenness was not frowned upon in male Mongol culture. Rather, it was seen as a form of manliness. In fact, Genghis Khan was often drunk, and one of his sons uh, died in a binge drinking incident. And that would fit with the whole, uh, these guys were barbarians vision of Mongol history. And I'm using the term civilization loosely here when I speak of Mongol civilization, because normally a civilization refers to people living inside cities, sedentary people. Remember that from section one. And that also implies uh, a certain level of cultural sophistication. We saw that in the first section on antiquity. But the Mongols were not known for their cultural achievements, and they certainly weren't sedentary. Instead, they would follow the herd, moving from place to place after exhausting the water or the grass in a given area, uh, hence uh, the bunny ears that I put around the term civilization. In lieu of permanent buildings, they lived in a yurt, which are tents made of animal felt, uh, very popular with hippies all the way to this day. Uh, but then in later years, that the, the Mongols grew rich through conquest, they kind of got tired of packing and unpacking their yurts every time they moved, uh, so they set up their yurt permanently on a cot drawn by oxen. Think of it as the medieval RV. The religion of the Mongols was a form of shamanism, and that term shaman is not unique to uh, Mongols. Uh, shamanism is actually a catch-all term for any kind of religion in Mongolia or elsewhere uh, that involves shamans, who are holy men or women, uh, who also serve as witch doctors. So the Mongols would worship a main god, Tengri, and a variety of spirits associated with natural forces. And the role of the, the shamans was to serve as intermediaries between the world of man and the supernatural world of gods and spirits. Uh, Mongols viewed natural springs as holy, so washing one's body, clothes, or dishes with spring water uh, was considered blasphemous, uh, which explained their poor hygiene habits. And that also gave them a fearsome appearance, which they used to scare their enemies away. Fun fact, the worst Mongol torture, which was earmarked for traitors, uh, was to boil someone alive. I guess they did take a nice hot bath every once in a while. So think of the Mongols as the caricature of a frat boy, filthy and piss drunk. Also, like some frat boys, the Mongols had unusual mating habits. Powerful men like Genghis Khan were polygamous. They had multiple wives and concubines, in addition to all the poor women that they raped when taking a city. In fact, Genghis Khan had so many children that if you count all his children, both legitimate or not, and these children's children over eight centuries, his descendants represent pretty much the entire population of Asia today. And I want to use this opportunity to underline something that rarely gets mentioned when people discuss war. Uh, we tend to focus on generals, their tactics, the siege of cities, etc. And then we only mention in passing that citizens were abused and that women were raped. Uh, but sexual abuse has been a key part of warfare for all of human history. And historians like me really need to make an effort to push it back uh, to the center of the narrative. And if you're interested in that issue, I recommend reading the book Our Bodies, Their Battlefields by Christina Lamb, which just came out and really opened my eyes on that issue. Uh, but back to the narrative. Uh, early in the Khan's life, the Mongols were not united. Instead, they belonged to various tribes or clans which fought each other constantly. And one goal of these endemic wars was to capture cattle and brides. Again, notice how sexual assault pops up again. Uh, the Khan's first wife, whom he had married at the ripe old age of 12, was captured in that manner in a raid by a rival clan. And then Genghis Khan led a raid to take her back. And by this point, the Khan's wife was pregnant by another man, but that didn't seem to matter. Contrary to many other societies, ensuring the legitimacy of one's progeny, that was not a priority for the Mongols. Maybe no one had told them about the, beer, uh, the birds and the bees. 
Another digression on the gender dimension of the Mongol story. I always wondered what women like the bride of Genghis Khan had to say about all this back and forth. Married when she was just a child, captured one way, then the other, forced to partner up with one stinky man after another. Whether she wanted to or not, uh, this cannot have been an easy life for her. And I would love to know what went through her mind. Uh, but unfortunately, historical sources tend to be silent on the matter. Most often, history is his story, not her story. And a man is telling you that. Anyway, uh, Mongolia was a rough and lawless place, divided between nomadic warring tribes who raised cattle, mistreated women, and raided each other. That was my point. I mentioned the Vikings earlier, but Mongolia was also reminiscent of Arabia before the time of Muhammad. And we studied those two civilizations in lectures 13 and 16, that's in the last section on the course uh, on the Middle Ages. The person who united the region was the Scourge of God, Genghis Khan, neither of which was his real name. Originally, he was known as Temujin. I think it means the blacksmith or something. So Temujin slash Genghis Khan was born around 1162 AD. He came from nobility, but he had a rough childhood. Uh, his dad, the leader of his tribe, was poisoned by a rival, so Genghis Khan his mom and his siblings were expelled from the tribe and they grew up in exile. So he spent the first half of his life fighting his own kin to reclaim his throne, and that included killing his brother by another mother. And then Genghis Khan spent his time fighting other nomadic tribes to unite them under his banner, and by banner I don't mean a boring old flag, uh, but the standard of Genghis Khan was a pole bearing nine yak tails, which is pretty cool. And finally, in 1206, he declared himself ruler of all the tribes who lived in Thert tents, i.e. all the people with Mongol, Turkish, and Kyrgyz blood, all the nomadic people. And he had finally created such a thing as Mongolia, and that's when he deserved the title of Khan, which means the king. We know a little about the internal working of that early Mongol empire because the Mongols were not a very literate people. Uh, the Khan himself was illiterate, and initially the Mongols did not even have a script to write down their language. But there are references to a code of laws known as the Yasa laws, Y-A-S-A, uh, of Genghis Khan. Uh, no complete copy has survived, but the main focus seems to have been loyalty to the chief in those laws. The worst crime under the Yasa laws was to disobey the Khan, and the worst torture, which I just mentioned, uh, was earmarked for traitors. And it worked. Uh, during his career, Genghis Khan occasionally sent a general with half his army a thousand miles away. That general could easily have seceded and made himself king, uh, but no one ever double-crossed Genghis Khan. So loyalty, uh, that was a key Mongol value. Either that or you know what happened to traitors. I want to take this opportunity to mention a movie about the rise of the Khan called Mongol. It's a Mongolian movie, so when I first saw it I was intrigued, but I did not expect much. I figured Mongolian cinema would be pretty basic. But the movie actually really good production values, and I recommend watching it. It's about the early life of the Khan, it ends just when he unites the Mongol tribes and it is set to, convert, uh, to conquer the world. One movie I would not recommend is The Conqueror, which is also about Genghis Khan, but from 1950s Hollywood. John Wayne plays the title character, and Susan Hayward is the love interest. These were the days when white actors played in blackface and yellowface, or in the case of John Wayne, he just slapped on a fake mustache and ta-da, John Wayne is now a Mongol king. That movie is awful, but fun awful. Uh, so bad it's good awful. Just grab a bottle of your favorite Mongol booze, round up a few sarcastic friends, and spend a fun evening hate watching it. Fun fact, the movie was so trashed by critics that the producer, Howard Hughes, uh, bought back all the print copies and simply took it off the market. Uh, but the rights have now been sold by the estate of Howard Hughes, so you should be able to locate a DVD for movie night. One last bit about the film, uh, it was shot not in Mongolia, but in Utah, immediately downwind from a site where the US government was conducting open-air nuclear tests at the time. Uh, so sadly, half the cast and crew uh, later died of cancer. But back to the real Genghis Khan, not John Wayne. As I said earlier, he had united all the nomadic tribes of Mongolia by 1206, 
And if you've done the math, by that point, Genghis Khan was in his 40s, a ripe age for that period, though a totally normal age today. 40 is just like the new 20. And that's when Genghis Khan decided to conquer the world, apparently because he saw himself as divinely empowered to rule the whole known world. We've seen this kind of megalomania when we studied Alexander the Great before. The Khan's first target was China, the much more populous and more sophisticated country to his south. That conquest was long and in fact was not even completed until after the Khan's death. Uh, the Mongols were brutal, but no matter how many Chinese they killed, there were still millions more. Uh, some Mongols even talked of wiping out the entire Chinese population, what we call a genocide today, and using the country as a vast grazing ground for horses. Thankfully, they never went ahead with that awful plan, and they decided to keep some Chinese people alive as taxpayers. And there was some money to be made. The income tax rate on the Mongols was only 1% if you were nomadic, but it was 10% if you were sedentary, like most Chinese people were. Genghis Khan then moved to Central Asia, where the king of Khwarazm had killed some Mongol diplomats. And that was a major no-no. The Mongols were cruel, but they respected diplomatic immunity. So the Mongols invaded that kingdom, they captured the capital, Samarkand, in 1220, and they put 30,000 defenders to death. They raped the women, again, uh, shipped off the artisans to Mongolia to work as slaves, and they took uh, the rest of the prisoners with them uh, to use them as human shields in the next siege. The next year, 1221, they seized the city of Merv. Uh, the Mongol commander then had promised to spare the population, uh, but when the city surrendered, he ordered all prisoners to be executed, except 400 artisans who were shipped off as slaves. Then it was off to the city of Nishapur, and again, every man, woman, and child in the town was killed, and also every cat and dog because the Mongols wanted to leave no one behind, not even a pet. I want to repeat one awful anecdote after another. You got the point. Uh, either people fought back and the Mongols killed them all for daring to resist, or they surrendered and the Mongols called them all cowards and killed them anyway. Uh, so some of these cities were so ravaged that they never rose from their ashes all the way to the present time. As historians, we're always trying to be neutral. We tell the facts and we try to understand the motives of historical actors instead of kind of judging them. Uh, so some historians have looked for the rationale behind uh, the Mongol violence, and there was one. Uh, because their army was fairly small, uh, the Mongols could not hope to control a large civilian population after the conquest. So they took a town, looted it, killed everyone, and then moved on. Uh, this way there was no need to spare troops to garrison the town. And I get the rationale, but that's still awful. I may be a historian, but I still have a moral code, and the sanctity of human life, that ranks pretty high in that code. Overall, the Mongols ended up conquering all of China, plus Korea, uh, all of Central Asia, a good chunk of the Middle East, including the Abbasid capital of Baghdad, which they sacked, and much of Russia and the Ukraine in Eastern Europe. Uh, they generally did well wherever there was a vast open plain for their cavalry. They did more poorly at sea when trying to conquer Japan, we'll see that uh, later in the section, or in the jungles of Southeast Asia where their horses could not deploy properly, or when facing heavily armored knights in Western Europe and Byzantium. But still, in a span of just 20 years, Genghis Khan had conquered the largest contiguous land empire in history. And he did that using a home population of maybe 500,000 people, so even when drafting most able-bodied adult males, his army was only about 100,000 men. How did he do it? Well, first, organization. Uh, his army of 100,000 was divided into Tumens, T-U-M-E-N, uh, 10,000 people. Uh, Tumen was like a division in the modern U.S. Army, a self-sufficient unit that could be dispatched on its own campaign. And each of these Tumens of 10,000 was then divided into units of 1,000, and then 100, and then 10. So the, the chain of command, uh, that was pretty clear, and Genghis Khan had a knack for picking loyal underlings, so the Mongol army was unusually disciplined. Uh, in Europe at the time, each knight hoped to find individual glory on the battlefield, so they often broke ranks to pick a fight with a rival or capture a rich noble that they could ransom. Uh, the Mongol army, by contrast, used elaborate battle tactics that were implemented 
to the letter. To practice those tactics, the Mongols would hunt. And I'm not talking here about the cans and a few drinking buddies chilling in a duck blind. I'm talking huge hunts covering dozens of miles and involving thousands of men. And each participant had a role to play in the hunt, like in a battle, pushing the game in that direction, for example. And disobeying these orders was punishable by death, even though that was just a hunt, uh, but it was a training exercise. In combat, a favorite tactic of the Mongols was a fake flight. Halfway through the battle, they would turn tail flee, as if in panic. Uh, then the enemy would break ranks, thinking that they had won the battle, and run to pursue the Mongols. And then once the enemy line was disorganized, all the Mongol army would turn around once more and kill their enemy piecemeal now that they were all over the place. Asking one's troops to pretend to flee, that's a tricky thing, because a fake panic can easily turn into a real one. Uh, but the Mongols were so disciplined that it worked. And they used that tactic multiple times, sometimes two or three times in a single battle, and yet somehow, uh, somehow no one ever caught up to them. So one good, of, uh, one good piece of advice, if you ever face Mongols in battle, don't chase them if they run away. It's just a ploy. Trust me. Another key to Mongol uh, success was mobility. A medieval army was slow, typically, because that included mounted troops, but also infantry, as well as siege weapons and a wagon train of supply. So moving 10 kilometers in a day, that was considered a good pace. A Mongol army uh, could cover 100 kilometers a day, uh, if need be. Each fighter had several horses, so short, stubby, enduring horses of Central Asia, uh, so that they could simply switch horses and keep riding when, was, when, when one was tired or injured. And when time was of the essence, uh, they would not even stop to cook. Instead, they placed meat under their saddle in the morning, and after riding all day, the meat would be uh, tenderized like a pulp, and the meat could be eaten raw. Another digression, but this time about fancy French cuisine. Uh, it may seem out of place, but I swear there's a connection. If you ever see steak tartare on a French menu, that means raw seasoned ground beef, just like the Mongols ate. Tartan, that's another name for the Mongols. So you don't see steak tartare on US menus because, well, there are problems with food safety here, uh, but you will see salmon uh, tartare, which is the same thing, but with fish. So try this next time you get a chance. Then finish off your milk with a yogurt or fermented mare milk, Mongol style, and a lot of booze. Uh, but back to the Mongol army. If time really was of the essence and there was no time to stop, not even for raw meats, the Mongol riders would simply lean over the nape of their horse, cut a small incision in the jugular vein, and then drink the blood of their horse. You may find that disgusting, but that made for a highly mobile army that could outnumber their opponents and defeat them piecemeal uh, before they could get their army together because they moved so fast. The typical Mongol warrior was a mounted archer uh, who had trained since childhood and could hit the target uh, with an arrow from 200 meters away uh, while at full gallop. Uh, and so with two or three backup horses at their disposal, uh, that army was unstoppable. Another key to Mongol success, and I think we're up to three by now, uh, was to avoid bloodshed. I don't mean the blood of their enemies, since they killed millions, uh, but their own bloodshed. Uh, the Mongol home population was so small that they could not afford losses. And that's why the Mongols preferred to use arrows circling around an enemy uh, army for hours, even days, taking targets from a distance and only closing in for close combat uh, once the enemy was weakened. They also used psychological warfare. Uh, their reputation was such that their enemies often decamped and fled to avoid fighting the scourge of God, Genghis Khan. The Mongols smell, their fearsome appearance, even their loud shrieks, all those were designed to scare away their enemy. Because they were few, the Mongols also liked to pretend that their army was much bigger than it was. They lit thousands of fires, uh, campfires at night, far more than needed. Or they put life-sized dolls on top of their spare horses, uh, who looked like the real thing from a distance, again, to make the army look bigger than it was. You didn't think that today's lecture would involve stinky, grown men drinking horse blood and playing with dolls, did you? Well, history is full of surprises. After a lifetime of conquest, plunder, rape, murder, Genghis Khan died in 1227. 
And I've heard many stories about his deaths. One of them is that he died when he fell from a horse, which would seem a bit humiliating for the leader of the horse people. So that's the story I like to tell in class. The funeral of Genghis Khan, that was something else. Uh, he had amassed a fortune in loot, so he was buried in an unmarked grave somewhere in the steppe so that his grave would not be looted by grave robbers. Uh, then they spread dirt and sowed grass seeds to hide the location. And then soldiers killed everyone who had been involved in the funeral party to make sure that they would not reveal the location of the tomb. Uh, and there are still many people still looking for his gravesite today, uh, so far without success. So that's something for you to do if you happen to be in Mongolia and you have time to kill. Find the grave of Genghis Khan. I might even award a couple bonus points in the class if you succeed. Both Genghis Khan, when he was alive, and then his successor, his son Ogodai, faced a major quandary. How to administer such a vast empire, the largest in history to date. When we studied big empires before, power was centralized in a capital, a city like Rome or Byzantium. But the Mongol equivalent, the city of Karakorum, that was nothing to write home about. A Tartar camp of felt yurts and ramshackle barracks. Uh, the Mongol Khan was usually not in town since he was a nomad. And eventually the capital was abandoned altogether in favor of Beijing, China. To their credit, the Mongols were aware of their cultural limitation and they were willing to seek advice from more advanced civilization. Uh, the Mongols, they had their own religion, but they were open-minded. Genghis Khan himself met Christian missionaries, Muslims, Taoists, Buddhists. Uh, the Mongols knew that they had much to learn from civilizations with more elaborate theologies. Uh, the Mongol Empire was also multi-ethnic, and the Mongols welcomed people of all backgrounds in their administration, as long as they didn't kill them first, of course. So we have some account of life in Karakorum written by, I don't know, a French artisan who had been enslaved on the other side of Asia, and I find those accounts fascinating. Once they decided not to kill the whole Chinese population, the Mongols figured that the Chinese, with their Confucian tradition, uh, were very good at governing. Uh, so the Mongols relied on them a lot for the backbone of their bureaucracy. And we also saw earlier that even when killing a whole town, the Mongols would save some skilled artisans, such as blacksmiths or makers of siege engines, and then keep them as slaves. And that made up for the Mongol deficiencies in the technical trades. Another key to keeping an empire together is communication. And we saw how the Persians built a royal highway to tie their empire together. Uh, same thing with the Roman roads. The Mongols didn't build a lot of roads per se, but they created an extensive messenger system known as the Yam, Y-A-M. Nothing to do with Thanksgiving in that case, or sweet potatoes, uh, think of the Pony Express in the Old West. Yam couriers were riders on horseback uh, who were tasked with sending important messages to and from all corners of the Mongol Empire. And there were relay stations at given intervals uh, so that the couriers could always get fresh horses and some food and then ride on without delay. And this way a message could cross all of Asia in a matter of weeks, not years, allowing the Mongol cavalry to respond quickly to any military emergency. The empire continued to strive and expand under the son of Genghis Khan, Ogodai. Uh, he served as the Great Khan, focusing on the conquest of China, while other family members oversaw more distant provinces, which were known as the Khanates, Mongol provinces. In practice, though, by the time the empire reached the next generation, that of uh, Kublai Khan, each Khanate became more and more distinct, both politically and culturally. Uh, the Mongols in the Middle East converted to Islam and essentially became a Muslim kingdom. Meanwhile, the great Khans of China became effectively a dynasty of Chinese emperors, the Yuan dynasty, who followed Confucian precepts. So the Mongol Empire was not actually toppled by a more powerful foe in battle. After a century, it simply kind of dissolved from within, absorbed by more advanced local cultures, and then breaking, to, breaking into regional components. You could say that the, uh, the empire went native. At least it's a somewhat positive ending to a bloody story. In the end, after all the massacres, the superior cultures won, and they taught the Mongols a thing or two. The pen is my ears and the sword. Well, that was heavy stuff, so we're going to stop here for today. Next time, we'll stick with the Mongol Empire, but we'll look at more peaceful activities, the commercial and diplomatic activities that thrived during the apex of the empire. Think Silk Road and Marco Polo. Au revoir. Goodbye.